You talk about the movies and the stars. Let me talk about the fans of all of this junk. Mm-hmm. Are you going to talk about me? Oh, you're a fan? And to talk about the fans, I think we should talk about the ultimate fan, as he's referred, Forrest J. Ackerman. Yay. Forey, as he called himself and as his <laughs> adoring fans called him, was a father of horror and sci-fi fandom. He was one of the first big collectors of movie memorabilia and his magazine, Famous Monsters of Filmland, which in large part was a display of his collection, inspired a new wave of horror films that, that became like the 60s and the 70s stuff. Everybody who was fans of the stuff he did grew up and made movies in the 60s and 70s. Mm-hmm. I think he was a, a big part of the resurgence of like campy 80s horror, which could be campy at times and they're fun and now they're being revered like the way that people revered the yeah. movies in the 50s. Yeah. So Forrest J, no initial point, J Ackerman, <laughs> was born in Los Angeles. He's a hometown hero, born on November 24th in 1916. I couldn't really track down what exact area he lived in. I have a feeling that he lived near the Coca-Cola plant on Central <laughs> Avenue by the 10 Freeway, but it also said he, he might have been like Chuck Jones, like a Hollywood kid. Mm. So I can't really figure out. His grandfather was George Wyman, the man who designed the Bradbury building. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, the Bradbury building, contrary to what I and probably a lot of people Wait, think... Brad Ray Bradbury didn't design that? Oh, my God. <laughs> I got to make a phone call. <laughs> I have so many people to apologize to. <laughs> contrary to what I and probably a lot of people think, it was not named after one of his best friends, Ray Bradbury. <laughs> it was named after a Lewis Bradbury, who was a mining millionaire turned real estate developer. Lewis Bradbury, I say. Yeah. In my heart, it's always going to be Ray Bradbury's yeah. building. It's always going to be Harrison Ford's... Theater. 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 Harrison Ford Theater. <laughs> Wyman himself designed the building based on a description from a science fiction novel called Looking Backward 2000 to 1887 by Edward Bellamy, who wrote it in 1887. In the novel, the hero is taken to a commercial store of a utopian society in the year 2000. Imagine that. 2000. The year what a, 2000. What a world that'll be. Here's the description. I was in a vast hall full of light. Received not alone from the windows on all sides, but from the dome, the point of which was a hundred feet above. Beneath it, in the center of the hall, a magnificent fountain played, cooling the atmosphere to a delicious freshness with its spray. <laughs> Is he talking about the subway that's in there? <laughs> <laughs> the walls and the ceilings were frescoed in mallow tints, calculated to soften without absorbing the light which flooded the interior. Around the fountain was a space occupied with chairs and sofas on which many persons were seated and conversing. With the exception of the fountain, everything seems pretty close to what Wyman would end up building six years after the novel was published. He put it up in 1893. The story of how Wyman was encouraged to move forward on the project is a strange one. Mr. Wyman and his wife, Forey's grandparents, were spiritualists. Uh, George was uncomfortable with taking the responsibility for the project because it was it was sort of too much for him at the time. So he consulted the spirits to see if it was a good thing to do. Using something called a planchet, which is similar to like a Ouija board, like, like the Ouija board piece, yeah. they traced out this message. If you build it, <laughs> Will live. <laughs> Mark Wyman, take the Bradbury building and you will be successful. Successful. That's very specific. It was very specific. Uh, I read somewhere else that it also said, take Bradbury building. It will make you famous. I don't know which one was true, but he, whatever, they consulted the planchet and it told him to move forward. The Bradbury building is one of the oldest office buildings in Los Angeles and it was used in several science fiction flicks such as Indestructible Man with Lon Chaney Jr., The Outer Limits, Blade Runner. His grandparents were also responsible in burying Forrest Ackerman in movies because they were rich and they I were thought, grandparents. I thought his grand, I thought his grandparents outlived him and they buried him with a bunch of cassette tapes or something. Ackerman said that in one year his grandparents themselves, nerds obviously for asking ghosts for advice and designing okay. buildings after a futuristic book. It took four to see 356 movies in one year. Really? And one day managed to get seven films in. What? All apparently in the Broadway theater Can you district. Can watch that much on Netflix in one day? <laughs> What's their internet speed like? While well, he watched a lot of movies, horror and science fiction were his favorite. His first big love as far as movies was The Phantom of the Opera. He remained a Lon Chaney fanatic all of his life. And his favorite film, which he never strayed from his entire life, he always said his favorite film was Fritz Lang's Metropolis. Mm. He also loved another science fiction film named Things to Come, which will ironically... Oh, I've a, seen that. Have you? Yeah. It's ironically a thing that will come back. It's a thing to come. Yeah. yeah. He slowly began leaning in the direction of science fiction. At the age of nine, he discovered an issue of amazing stories and completely fell in love with it. He kept that exact issue his entire life because he kept everything his entire life. Because he was mentally ill. <laughs> because he had his a disorder. <laughs> <laughs> he began collecting stuff around that age. And when his pulp paperback collection reached 27, his mother had to warn him, like, someday your collection is going to hit 100. And he said, I'll show you, wench. I'll show you how much a nerd can hoard. At the age of 10, 
10, he was writing to magazines and studios offering his opinions on movies. And as early as 13, he was writing science fiction stories and getting them published. In 1931, he wrote A Trip to Mars that was published with the San Francisco Chronicle. And around that same time, he was an associate editor for The uh, Time Traveler, which many cite as the first fanzine. He wrote his entire career while he worked uh, on the jobs that he ended up becoming famous for. And he always published under really <laughs> insanely nerdy pseudonyms <laughs> like Dr. Acula. <laughs> he was a, fr- I guess he, he worked with Ed Wood. So I always wondered if that scene in Ed Wood where Ed Wood's trying to pitch Dr. Acula. <laughs> I don't get it. Dracula. I always wondered if that's a, a nod to Forrest Ackerman. No. No. It's stupid. Trust me. He also went under um, SF Balboa, Jacques de Forest Erman, Clairvoyant. Oh, God. Trigonometry J. Pointexter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, supposedly was writing for a low key under the counter lesbian magazine called Vice Versa under the name Lorgy Ermain. <laughs> Now, as we both know now, the 30s was the heyday for horror films. Universal monsters were some of the most recognizable monsters around. And I just said that. <laughs> I literally just said that. Can we rewind this? Now, because he was flourishing as a nerd and the studios were recognizing his name, when he came around asking for studio props and collectibles, which at the time they were just going to give away, they were not reluctant to just hand it over to this guy who was asking <laughs> for it. So he started with movie stills and posters at first, and then he started getting props and really good ones too. As his career where went on he became more famous eventually he would acquire his entire collection as gifts like they would make a movie and like what do we do this give it to Forrest Ackerman <laughs> on a personal note speaking of early horror he was one of the only people to see that lost uh, Lon Chaney film uh, London After Midnight oh yeah thanks for bringing it are up are talking by about senior or junior senior you f- chucklehead <laughs> we, we only know London After Midnight from uh, these incredible steals and in steals? his still steals still like a steel mill like steel mill a movie steel mill so in his collection of stuff that he had not only had he seen london after midnight in his collection he has lon cheney's top hat and the teeth from the movie oh, it's not it, his he, fake teeth open that grave up <laughs> Flory at this time he was in his late teens was becoming a homing beacon for like-minded nerds who are becoming obsessed with this new genre i don't know if you know who ray Har- harryhausen is the special effects guru yeah that's right the paramount of the special effects industry <laughs> who created a uh, form of stop motion model animation known as dynamation which <laughs> is when the screen is split so actors and stop motion monsters can mm. be on the same screen together he created the original mighty joe young he did monsters for uh, it came from beneath the sea 20 million miles to earth jason and the agronauts 1 million uh, years agronauts. bc what did i say agronauts isn't that what it's called no <laughs> Let me start over then. <laughs> he did the dinosaurs in one million years BC, and then he also did all the stuff in Clash of the Titans. Was one of my favorite movies. The new one. Yeah. Then. The what about Wrath one. of the Titans? Did he do that? He did the muscles on all the men. <laughs> when uh, Harry Housen was a young man, he was out in Hawthorne watching King Kong for maybe the third or fourth time. And after the film, he was leaving the lobby, and he wanted to photograph these beautiful movie stills that they had. And he asked the theater manager, oh, is it okay if I take pictures for this impending career that I want to, I need inspiration for the, what I'm going to do with my life? And he's like, oh, it's not, it's, it's not ours. It's this kid named Forrest Ackerman. Here's his phone number. So they got in contact and he came over Forrest Ackerman's house. He's like, hey, nice house. Cool stuff here. I like how you have everything from King Kong. Let's be friends forever. And they were friends forever. Cute. Cute. It's a cute story. It's a neat cute. <laughs> um, I don't know if he had these at the time that Harryhausen came over or not, but at some point in his career, he has the Brontosaurus and the Pterodon from King from the original King really? Kong. He has it in his collection, yeah. Oh my God. Didn't that... Uh, no, no, no. The T-Rex is the one that King Kong ripped his jaw open. I was he thinking that it was two T-Rexes fighting each other, but then I thought, wait, where's King Kong? <laughs> <laughs> Just sitting back and watching. <laughs> yeah, almost, I, like, I this. like this. I could get used to this. <laughs> he was the founder of a nerd club called the Los Angeles Science Fiction Society, which started in 1934 with editor of Wonder Stories magazine, Hugo Gernsback. Uh, he put up a flyer for a meet in a bookstores all around LA, and one of these nerds who responded was a young Ray Bradbury. That's how they became friends. The LASFS uh, started meeting on the 7th or 8th floor of the Pacific Electric Building on Main Street. Street, but then soon moved operations to the brown room of Clifton's Cafeteria, oh, really? where there was free limeade and lime juice for everybody. <laughs> and if I was a member, I couldn't have any because I have acid reflux, so they would have kicked me out. Nerds love yeah, tangy They wouldn't stuff. let you in anyway. Excuse me. I will be with the horrors. They also got free food if Clifton saw that you didn't have any money. Clifton would just like find whatever. That's Clifton for you. And there's a theme throughout this. I realized afterwards that Ray Bradbury didn't have a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. That's why he spent so much time in the library. <laughs> That's why he said school was dumb. <laughs> All you need is a library. Can I have some change? That's the full quote. 
Can I have some change for food and feeding the typewriter at the library? Anyways, they met every Thursday night and would discuss matters such as space platforms, going to the moon, which hadn't <laughs> happened yet. And one of the members was a rocket expert. And he was able to comment on the matter. Also part of this club was two authors I really like, Lee Brackett, who wrote a science fiction epic called The Long Tomorrow, as well as writing screen for Empire Strikes Back. The Long Goodbye, which was an adaptation of Raymond Chandler's novel. She was also one of the best female authors in science fiction history. Just whatever, no big deal. Henry Cutner, who wrote a lot of pulp classics like Rats in the Graveyard, which is really good. You think I wouldn't like it? I like it. Robert Heinlein, who wrote Stranger in a Strange Land, was part of this group. A lot of cool people. I wouldn't have been part of it. Nope. You would have. Yeah. Nerd. They would have liked me. You I would look, have been their king. You would have been their king, and you would have loved free food and limeade. <laughs> I would have loved that. God. God damn it. Anyway. Born the, in the wrong time. <laughs> the brown room. I also feel like I could have been Dracula, but. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, everybody could have been Dracula. If you got there before Bella Lugosi, you would have been offered the part. <laughs> the brown room of the Clifton Cafeteria became known as the Imperial Court of Science Fiction. The epicenter, like what is now science fiction lore, like starts there, basically, wow. because of Forrest Ackerman. I want to eat in that room. A week after meeting Bradbury, Forey hired this out-of-work chump to come to his home and start working on Ackerman's fanzine, Imagination, where Bradbury would, in 1938, publish his first story. You know, because the only way he can get a story in is if he's the editor. Uh, he also <laughs> paid for Bradbury's bus ticket to New York so he and Forey could attend. No money. This no man. money. Nothing. He had a... There, like even Uncle Ernie. <laughs> I just need a bus ticket to that there New York City. I wrote a thing about quantum physics. <laughs> so they both could attend the world's first science fiction convention in 1939. This was a big deal for several reasons in regards to fandom and Forey. Uh, Forey dressed up for the event as a hero from Things to Come, one of his favorite science fiction films. No one had ever dressed up like that before. This was one of the first instances of cosplay at a convention. Wow. Yeah. He really was a loser. He was a nerd. Oh my! He probably had the at the, the real costume <laughs> from the movie. <laughs> Where'd you make that? No, I I got it in the future. <laughs> Where my grandfather made it. So Bradbury and Ackerman were really great friends. They're friends for their entire lives. Uh, there's a really great photo of the two of them in 1939 dressed up as like ghouls for Halloween. And they would later, after that photo was taken, go to a showing of the Cat and Canary, where they ended up scaring a little girl in the audience. <laughs> he would also lend money to Bradbury to create his own fanzine, Future of Fantasia. No money. Always needed money. Loser. Chump. He maybe he shouldn't be burning all those books. <laughs> Could have sold a few. And once again, we have to announce that World War II happens, and soon after that, poor little nerd Forey Ackerman was sent off, or enlisted, I don't know, but he was stationed safely in Fort MacArthur in San Pedro. He never once saw... <laughs> was he involved with the... The uh, yeah, Battle rounding. of Los Angeles. He's probably the one. <laughs> Aliens! <laughs> He's the one that started the alien rumor. <laughs> I know how to squash this butt quick. <laughs> not even. He would have been on, on. He would have been as high as possible. Not high, like getting high. He would have been like <laughs> the highest peak possible. Like, take me. I'm ready. <laughs> I've, I've studied your culture, and I'm ready to go with you. <laughs> it's just a Japanese kamikaze pilot. <laughs> oh, that I'm, that I'm not interested in. <laughs> Safe in Fort MacArthur. He never saw any combat. But what he did do was run the um, the newsletter, the Fort MacArthur Bulletin, which I'm sure he tried to sneak in references to Jupiter. <laughs> and they're like, stop. No puns. The only space we want is between words. Don't do this to us. He was very happy to be done with the military, even though he never saw combat. And he was only like 40 miles from home. Sounds like me at camp. War is hell. <laughs> His experiences before and during the war on the publication led Ackerman to pursue a career as a literary agent. And in his catalog, he had Isaac uh, Asimov. He had A.E. Asimov. Asimov. You know, what? I was just making fun of somebody in my life for correcting somebody of how they pronounced it. And here I am doing it. You're a scumbag. Eh, what can I say? Eh, I need to be corrected. Apparently, I need to have my pants dropped. I need to be spanked in front of everybody. <laughs> Please don't use the S word. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse my foul language. I apologize. <laughs> he had in his repertoire, he had A.E. Van Vogt. He had Rod Serling. He also worked with L. Ron Hubbard, the headpiece of Scientology, <laughs> when Hubbard was a young science fiction writer. Yeah. He insinuated that he was a liar and also... <laughs> <laughs> you know, for a lot of different things. He also worked with uh, Ed Wood, who he regarded as a drunk. Edward, Ed, Edward. Edward D. Wood Jr. Edward Jr.? Jr.? Yeah, Edward Jr., yeah. He was a drunk, yeah. He was a drunk. Yeah. Okay, we can't take that away from him. No. 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 He was them. one thing. <laughs> he was a drunk. He's probably bad at that, too. Waka waka. <laughs> so in the 50s, movies started leaning because of the atomic age towards monster movies, like monsters that were giant. I told you this. I Listen, told you all of this. Did already. we write this together? Harryhausen was perfecting claymation and dynamation at this time, so he was a big part of uh, this this lean towards these certain kinds of movies because the technology was there. Also popular was campy horror films, like they were getting goofier, parodying, as, a, as you said. And the audience got much younger, in particular young boys, like the one we have sleeping right here. <laughs> 
Also around this time, localized <laughs> horror hosts were becoming... What's in his bag? <laughs> he the, better have some jelly beans. Does he have any now and later? <laughs> That's so Smarties away. We're doing him a favor. <laughs> yeah, favor. <laughs> I like Smarties. I feel yeah. like I'm always defending myself you, for liking Smarties. Smarties. You are. You are. You, you, for your whole life, you will be. <laughs> around this time, localized horror hosts were becoming popular, and young boys and girls were staying up late at night watching classic monster movies with goofy, pun-driven horror hosts such as Zachary and Vampira. <laughs> So because there was this huge fan base for old classics and new monster movies as well, there was this huge window left open for something to come in and solidify the fandom. So he hooked up with publisher named James Warren of Warren Publishing who has put out really great horror comics like Eerie and Creepy. If you know those, nope, they're really great horror comics. I had podcast over. In 1958, Ackerman and Warren created Famous Monsters of Filmland, which funny enough was referred to as Forey's Folly. Another folly for us. A lot of follies. A lot of follies, which had a real fancy... Nobody believes in anything. Nobody, no. And then they succeed and then they get squashed by society. This is a perfect time to bring up... Have you ever had a Dianetics test? Are you happy as a person? We both know people? the answer. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes, I'm happy. <laughs> I'm very happy. I don't need a personality test. I'm fine the way I am. What are they called? E something? Uh, Ecstasy. What are You're they? the nerd. I'd ask you. Um, I. Uh, what? What are? Um, th- thetas. Okay. Thetas. All right. I'm glad we just spent that much time <laughs> promoting a religion that. Uh, isn't one of us. I can't afford that. I would love to. Can't afford it. Someday when I'm rich, I'm going to be a Scientologist. <laughs> like Jason Lee, Giovanni <laughs> Ribisi, and the lady from King of Queens. <laughs> my three favorite actors. <laughs> Famous Monsters of Filmland had a real fanzine quality to it. It was printed on really cheap paper, and it was black and white. It was really cheaply made, except for the cover, which was always beautiful. But it quickly became popular. It was the first issue sold 200,000 copies. The first the issue? The first issue. You know how many downloads we had of our first episode? 199,000. Yeah, we didn't make it. I mean, it sounds like a little bit, but... We didn't get Famous Monsters listeners. <laughs> we got as much listeners as the homeless guy who's talking to himself in the desert. Cacti. I got the plural down. Cactuses? Cactopus. <laughs> the magazine was aimed at 11-year-old boys who were monster-hungry. Famous Monsters was fueled by the love of horror and sci-fi, which was there because of Forey. Silly puns, which Forey was fantastic at. He was great at wordplay. And it was also uh, fueled by Forey's large collection of memorabilia. He was able to use all his movie stills and posters as photographs within the magazine himself. He didn't have to ask studios for permission. He had all these stills. So he just used them in the magazine. Sounds like copyright infringement. That's not what brought him down. <laughs> the cover of the first issue has Warren dressed like a well-dressed and groomed Frankenstein and a beautiful blonde looking up at him adoringly. And I feel like this sums up 50s and 60s horrors so perfectly. <laughs> you have this horrid monster and the woman who loves him. But most covers were drawn beautifully, and I really do mean beautifully, by an artist named Basil Gogos, <laughs> who, did, who has a great monster name. Look, the, <laughs> Is it B- Basil Gogos? Basil Gogos. Basil Gogos. Basil Gogos. Yeah. He's great. You should look up the, the covers. They're fantastic. They make monsters look so alluring <laughs> and monstrous, but beautiful. It's, he just, I had to give a shout out to him. I hate, I hate the phrase shout out. Well, wow. You're the one saying it. You're the only one that's saying it. I had to give him a mention out. Famous monsters talked about old movies and new movies and paid tribute to the movies and the stars, but not only them, they also paid a lot of tribute to the behind the scenes men, which was part there. I feel like this I is. I love that band. Like horror has a certain love for guys who are able to do special effects well and i think yeah. it stems from famous monsters being able to pay tribute to like oh jack pierce did this oh you know rick baker did this and stuff like that he also paid a really big tribute to his fans the fans of the magazine so all these encouraging fans to send in photos of them in their costumes and, and makeup that they did themselves and he would publish it in he also included his phone number in each issue so fans could call him but back then how many people really had phones you can climb up the, the telephone pole. <laughs> and put a, a tin cup on it and yeah, listen and it, to the end. Mm-hmm, yeah. You, we've all seen Green Acres. <laughs> it's the place to be. So I hear. <laughs> it's not as good as that Pedigo Junction, but you know. <laughs> seen too much TV. The magazine was bursting at the seams with silly puns. Readers were encouraged to write in Fang Mail. Oh, God. He would always give fans what they axed for. Oh, After all, he was a fan of the printed weird. Oh, <laughs> All kinds of puns. James Warren used to hold up a sign that said, I am an 11-year-old boy right like, to me. And that's what you got. Yep. Speaking of puns, Forrest Ackerman is responsible for the term sci-fi as a pun on hi-fi, high fidelity, or science fiction. <laughs> he said if you were a fan of soap operas, you must love cry-fi. Uh, and if you love James Bond, like the Menendez brothers, you must love, guess it, um... Spy-fi. Oh, uh, I was going to say uh, Spy Another Day. 
I don't know. <laughs> this is why I was not Forrest J. Ackerman. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's all very punny. <laughs> the magazine had his patent and title of humor and his love of horror and science fiction. It, it was like an extension of his personality, which is why people took to it so well. In the magazine, he also featured himself a lot, that, the big ham, and he referred to himself as Uncle Forey. And because of his prominent appearance in his own magazines, kids really grew to admire him as one of their own, like a big kid. He was called by Robert England, we also know him as Freddy Krueger, as the Went to see son. Went to see son. Why did we bring that up? Because uh, he's here with us right now. <laughs> this is all a dream, people. Do you want to say something, Mr. England? Oh, no? Oh, okay. <laughs> it's probably best he doesn't talk. He's what? not that interesting. I mean, he is here, but he's just not that interesting. Also here, <laughs> Rick Baker and the body of Bela Lugosi. Oh, we just had to know about the medallion. Fresh as a daisy. It's there. He is not cast in a new. He is cast in a new Frankenstein versus uh, Wolfman remake by Mick G. <laughs> We're trying to stage his career comeback that he always <laughs> wanted. What better actor to play the undead than the dead? But well, we again got him hooked on methadone. Oops. <laughs> our fault. Our fault. <laughs> I'll, complete, I'll take full responsibility for that. As well as featuring articles and interviews and puns, the back ads of the magazines are just as renowned. They, they were put together by the Captain Company, which put out toys and horror memorabilia and has been especially nostalgic to old fans. I have a couple issues and I go through it and I'm like, I could still order this, right? <laughs> you get masks, model kits, life-size monsters, costumes. Like Dana Gould says, you get a monster mask and an apron with a photo of the monster you are. So really, you're just dressed up as a fan of that monster. They sold action figures, cardboard cutouts. They sold dolls. They have a life size, and he was tall. Zachary poster to put on your door, and I want it. <laughs> they still have a website, Captain Company, and you can go there and get Famous Monsters shirts. Famous Monsters of Filmland is also responsible because of Captain Company and Forey's own collection with creating the nerd who collects everything subculture slash disorder. Now let's talk about Forrest Ackerman's house, yeah? Yeah. 2495 Glendower Avenue in Los Feliz. I believe up in the hills around Mount Doom, you know, some people refer to it as the Griffith Observatory. <laughs> Forey had other names for that area. He would refer to the area as Horrorwood mm -hmm. or Holy Weird uh, in the beautiful state of California. <sighs> King of it. That's why the Fort MacArthur Bulletin was like, <laughs> kick it back enough. a notch enough we gotta end this war <laughs> the deciding factor in dropping the bomb on Japan <laughs> we gotta end this magazine it was the headquarters for famous monsters of film which means the address was printed in the magazine along with his telephone number but the house was also just his 18 room house he lived there <laughs> and fans were encouraged to come by on the weekends and take a tour of the place led by Ackerman and his wife Wendane when they started doing tours Wendane tour Wendain, yeah she was German, I think. Mm. Uh, they started doing tours in Trader. 1951. I, to this day, will keep meeting people who are like, oh yeah, I went there. Oh yeah, I met him. Like my, my older brother, Mondo, and his wife, or his then girlfriend really? had been there. And they're like, oh, we didn't know you would be into that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I might have been into that kind of thing. Oh, you like fun? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you like to see everything in every movie since forever? <laughs> I had to, and you can, watch tours of the place on YouTube led by Uncle Forey himself. They have a lot of footage of it. The Acker Mansion, as it's called, of course, obviously, of, course, of course, was practically a museum of movie memorabilia, which the Smithsonian Institute called one of the 10 best private collections in the world. Wow. He had 125,000 movie stills, 50,000 books. In one interview, he says um, that people approach him and say, oh, you haven't read every single book in the collection. He's like, I've read every last word. <laughs> Whenever I get a new book, I turn to the last page and I read the last word. <laughs> uh, he has movie props. He has posters. He's a liar. <laughs> He's a snake, like a Hubbard. <laughs> he has movie props, posters. He has a lot of monster models used in movies. He has autographs. He has 250 editions of Frankenstein, or 255 editions of the Dracula novel, Frankenstein novel. He has, like I said, some dinosaurs used in the original King Kong. He has life masks, which are really creepy, of like Karloff and Peter Lorre. Yeah. And yeah, I know. Lugosi, Vincent Price. He has one for Lon Chaney, who was a big fan of Charles Blouton. He has a. And he has uh, the guy who played the Gill Man's actual face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bill. Yeah, he's over there. Bill Man. <laughs> he has a prop coffin used in Frankenstein, which he used as a coffee table. He has a shred of the wrappings used in The Mummy. He has Dracula's cape that Lugosi used in the stage play and some movies. He used the one that was used in Plan 9 from Outer Space. Oh, wow. He has two rings, one that Lugosi wore in Abbott and Castellamy, Frankenstein, and uh -huh. one that Karloff wore in The Mummy, 
<laughs> both of which he wore regularly well into life for anything he did. That was his engagement ring. <laughs> Do you? Will you be my bride of Frankenstein? <laughs> he also had a room dedicated just to Karloff and Lugosi, which I'm sure to have to share the room, the audacity. He also had a room dedicated just to Lon Chaney, which he had incredible stuff. His old buddy Harryhausen gave for a lot of monsters he used in movies. He has currency and the mon uh, monocle used in Metropolis, his favorite science fiction film. I was thinking of the Monopoly. <laughs> he has the origin story comic boards for Vampirella. It's a sexy vampire that he and comic artist Trina Roberts created. He created Vamp Vampirella. When I was a kid, my mom took me to uh, something called the San Diego Comic Convention, which people now know as Comic-Con. Hmm. And uh, I fell in lust with Vampirella. <laughs> I have a, uh, a signed photo from some hussy who dressed up like her, whatever <laughs> year that was. He has the last autograph from Vincent Price, who was on his deathbed. He's like, hey, Flory, come over here. God. I know. He has a $35,000 functioning gremlin that two of his biggest fans, special effects wizard Rick Baker, who did the transformation scene in American Wealth in London, and Joe Dante, who did Gremlins and The Howling. What happens if he gets it wet? Joe Dante, who's a biggest fan, who's a really great director, who did The Howling, put uh, for a, a cameo in uh, The Howling. He has a framed copy of a two-page short story that a 13-year-old boy had sent him called The Killer. It was written by a little kid named Steve King. Little Stevie King? Little Stevie King wrote it. Stephen Prince when he was younger. <laughs> if you couldn't catch that, it grows up to be Stephen King. Oh. I got it. All right, now I get it. I think, in my opinion, the crowning jewel uh, on a personal level for Fourier was a painting called um, Amazing Fouries. It was done by the same artist who drew the cover for the ama Amazing Stories issue that he kept all his life that initially was the catalyst for his entire love of sci-fi. The painting is almost the exact same image, except the artist added Forrest Ackerman into it, and he added at the bottom, this is your life, Forrest J. Ackerman, <laughs> which I think is really neat. Uh, in the guest book, all Lugosi could write was Amazed. That's all he knew how to write in English. <laughs> in English. <laughs> he was so hopped up. His fans, like like I said, Rick Baker, Joe Dante, uh, John Landis, Roger Corman, George Lucas, were all growing up and had been inspired by Forey and famous monsters of film land, so much so that they wanted to make monster movies now. And they were making really great ones. And it said that the first time that Steven Spielberg and Stephen King met, the first thing they talked about was famous monsters of film land. Hmm. Now, Forey has a lot of cameos in movies. Like I said, he was in The Howling. He's in a quick scene in Thriller, the Michael Jackson uh, music video directed by John Landis. Inspired by the Boris Karloff TV show. It's all a big net. He wasn't a great actor, but the fans just loved seeing him. Like, most of the time, he was instantly recognized because any true horror fan would be like, oh, that's Uncle Forey. But times were changing. The late 60s, early 70s horror films were, were just, like, hate sleaze and angry and had very little room for, like, the fun, innocent monster movies of the late 50s. Exploitation stepped in with gore and nudity, and there was a lot of competition as far as other monster magazines, such as... Vietnam! <laughs> You had Fangoria, you had Monster Mania, you had Monster Times to compete with. You also had movies like Herschel Gordon Lewis was doing like Blood Feast and 2000 Maniacs, which didn't fit into any magazine <laughs> of that time other than like Hustler. Like those are ugly, hateful movies and I love them so much. Mm -hmm. Famous Monsters tried keeping up, but it was, was kind of awkward and it lost its true quality of affection. So the magazine ended up folding in 1982, but Ackerman kept driving forward as a literary agent. He also kept free tours of the Ackermansion and there was also a live horror host there which I think was really neat. And I wish there was video of that because he would have been really, he would have been the best at it. He would have been like a Bob Wilkins or Joe Bob Briggs. It was just his personality and his love for movies. He didn't have to dress up. You could say, oh yeah, <laughs> Uncle Forey, you don't need to do it. He's like, Mr. Rogers, yeah, you're fine. So then sad stuff happens. You know how I love Targets from Peter Bagdanovich, which has mm -hmm. Boris Karloff's last movie? His first movie, by the way. Was it really his first yep. movie? He's also in the movie as an actor. Yep. Boris Karloff's last movie. Yep, well, in sort of. Oh, sort of. I love it because it's about how people keep making these horror movies about castles and curses, but the true horror is like real stuff, like Kent State and Charles Whitman going into a clock tower and gunning down a lot of people, and how random violence was in the air in the 70s. Anyways. <laughs> Anyways, in 1990, the love of his life, Wendine, was killed during a violent carjacking in Italy, and she was stabbed, and then she died from kidney failure. God. Like, imagine that happening to someone who loved innocent horror movies and it was as friendly and nerdy as Forrest Ackerman. Like, the love of his life must have been devastating. Around the same time, and maybe because he was trying to occupy himself with his other love, he tried, some say, was persuaded to revamp Famous Monsters of Filmland. Revampire, as he probably called it. I could be him. Any day of the week. <laughs> but he had a falling out with the new publishers and ended up losing his hold on the magazine as well as losing a lawsuit which financially crippled him. So much so that he had to sell off the Acker Mansion and his astounding collection. In an interview, he sort of bitterly says like Spielberg or Lucas could have paid for it in petty cash. <laughs> like he could have paid for somewhere to store all of this. So if you see a famous monster to film around, don't buy it because it's not, it's not endorsed by Ackerman. It's whoever won that lawsuit. 
know. Ray Bradbury told Alec Times very angrily, we live in a stupid world. I believe in the future, <laughs> Forrest believed in the future, and no one else cared. <laughs> and, you know, you can't ask Ray Bradbury for money. Things to come. <laughs> Soon after, he suffered a stroke and he had an infection, so that put him in the hospital. A dedicated and loyal fan, Tim Sullivan, who ended up doing a remake of 2000 Maniacs called 2001 Maniacs, because it was put out in 2001, was there by his side when they gave Ackerman his last rights. But... That's not how all his horror last, movies his go. His last bites. <laughs> Ackerman survived against all predictions that monstrous son of a gun. He established the son of Acker Mansion, which was a much smaller bungalow, but <laughs> he housed all the most prized <laughs> possessions. Public <there>. storage. <laughs> <laughs> People like Sullivan and many other uh, loyal fans would take old Uncle Forey out to the House of Pies, or the House of Dies, as I like to call it. <laughs> like every really? Yeah, they take him out to the House of Pies. I d normally don't like that place, but I suddenly am hungry for pie houses right now die houses <laughs> now still well respected in the horror and sci-fi cult horror and sci-fi culture he lived to be 92 years old he passed away in 2008 oh. but because of his supreme hamminess you can see him on the countless interviews on youtube you can watch ackerman Mansion tours you could watch on youtube this like hour-long footage of a famous monsters of film on convention where you see like ray bradbury and joe dante and john lannis just eating dinner, just hanging out in, the, in a ballroom somewhere. Uh, you can see him in cameos. You can always track down an old issue of Famous Monsters of Filmland from eBay and call up the number and you never know who will pick up the ghost of Forrest yeah. Ackerman or just some asshole living in Los Feliz. That's this isn't Forrest Ackerman. Please it's, leave a message. It's Bella Lugosi. And that's the story of Forrest Ackerman, Uncle Forrest, as I, like I call him. him now. I like him too. I like him. Nerd. Yep. He would have liked, I mean, Allie Meekly, he would have liked oh it. Oh my god, he would have been our only like. <laughs> Is that a pun? I better jump all over it. <laughs>